So welcome, Jackie, Wael, Ola, and anybody else who's joining us. Uh, you're very welcome to this, this webinar with Empower World. My name's Marie Quigley, and we're going to be speaking with Sue Knight, the master of NLP. I'm sure you all have heard about her book, NLP at Work, and the amazing work she's done over the last 20 odd years in the field of NLP. So I'm very honored to have Sue here tonight. And for us to share, or for Sue to share with us a little bit about her journey and the program she's bringing, bringing to Qatar in October. So before we do that, just let's have a li few uh, little ground rules of how this webinar will work. So it would be useful for sound interference if you could mute yourself and you do that by going to the bottom left hand corner of this Zoom screen and there's a little microphone and it should say, yeah, you've all done that, thank you. You've all muted yourselves. Throughout, as if, if there's only a few of us, when you want to raise a question, uh, you could raise your hand and then uh, unmute yourself. But there is also, if you look along the bottom of your screen, there is a chat format that if you type something, like I'm doing now, you should, you should see that message and you can type a question in there and I can get hold of that question and when Sue's finished, finished talking or somebody else has finished answering the question, I can raise that. Is that clear? Is that okay with everyone? Okay. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions before we begin? Okay, then um, Sue, I'm going to let you introduce yourself as you know okay. yourself more than anybody else. <laughs> okay, well, I think thank you, and thank you for setting this up, uh, Marie. And I know you're recording this as well because I think that some, certainly some people in the UK, it's kind of a travel home from work time at the moment yes. um, so I know it'll be valuable for them to be able to pick up a recording later yes. so um, yes you said over 20 years I think it's very scary I think it's been nearly 30 years since I uh, got introduced to NLP so if I just say a little bit of the background to that and my involvement in it I know that Jackie who's online knows knows a lot about, about my background and she she's trained with me she maybe can share some things about that um, I was attracted to NLP uh, not because I knew what it was um, but I was attracted because of somebody's example somebody I met on a training program who was helping to run a program and that's been a continued theme for me. I actually have that as one of my main criteria that um, I believe that people who are well trained in NLP, um, that the best testimony is that people think that they are attractive examples of what they do and who they are. So I don't, I hate it if people say, oh, you know, I've had NLP done to me. I feel it should be invisible. It should be seamless. And it's more about the way somebody is. So that was how I came to discover it because I was so impressed by this person's example. And it was actually on a writing course, which was kind of coincidental because it went full circle. I never expected to um, finish up writing about NLP. I went on a writing course to help promote my business. I just left the corporate world. And this particular person, it was a man called Roy Johnson. Um, I just found that the way that he listened and the interest that he took in people, um, it was way beyond the, the kind of normal trainer, the normal consultant. There was something just very sincere, very authentic, very professional, very graceful. And I, he was one of those people I thought, well, whatever he's had, you know, I'd like to have some of the same if it's not just a... Um, I mean, I think a lot of it was naturally who he was, but he definitely trained. And he said, well, um, I've studied NLP. Um, and this was what he was doing on the, on the writing course. He had studied the writer and he was sharing what he'd learned about this writer's techniques. The writer on his own probably couldn't have run the course, uh, not in the same way. So Roy Johnston had, if you like, modeled in NLP terms, this writer's beautiful way of writing 
you've just disappeared, but can you hear yeah, me okay? I think somebody else has joined us. So that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a crowd. Yeah, and that does a little bit of background noise with that. Uh, All right. Welcome, Sudhi. Yes, thank you very much. Well, welcome. Would you mind muting yourself if you go to your left yeah. hand? Lovely. And Sue will continue. Thank you, Sadiq. You're very welcome. And uh, so he said, well, there is a program and there was only one at the time um, in the UK, very few in the world uh, on NLP. And I enrolled in that program without really knowing what it was, but just knowing that I wanted to learn some of the things that he learned. And that was how my journey started. So I had no idea what NLP was really at the time. Um, but I, my journey has been kind of peppered with people whose examples have really inspired me. Um, so that very much continued. And those people have really shaped the way that I work and what I do today. So that was a long time ago. Um, and I couldn't have predicted where it was going to take me. And one of the descriptions of NLP that I like, uh, that it's about being not knowing. And that might sound strange in some circumstances, but there's a lot of processes, a lot of the coaching processes, um, and the modeling, the studying with the people that requires us to be naive and to let go of what we know in order to discover. It's interesting because I've been in, I spend a lot of time with course delegates. And then when I spend time with other people, it's interesting the contrast, how very rarely in conversation, not that I would expect them to, but that other people would take this naive approach to asking. They make a lot of assumptions. They ask a lot of questions that are based on what they think will be the answer. Um, so a not knowing state is, um, is how we are as children. And in a way, we're learning to be that again when we learn NLP so that we can discover things and we can really discover naively what other people are capable of. And it starts with ourselves. It starts about learning about ourselves. So, so any questions from you, Marie, at that point? Yeah, what, what you say about this, this um, naivety, I, I think it's essential from a, from yes. a coaching perspective as well to have that, um, that curiosity of a five-year-old that really looks at all the facets of what's going on. And, and as you said, you don't make assumptions about no. other people. Um, what, what struck me when I, when I came across your work with NLP, so I, I, I'd come across throughout my own work in coaching NLP many times, but your work and your book in particular, because that's how I discovered you, just simplified um, the mist around <laughs> because I think it can seem a bit um, highfalutin a bit um, yes complicated and yes and it and it isn't it's it is common sense that that was my goal in writing that book because when I joined the program that I mentioned um, I was there were about 60 people on that program it was the equivalent of a practitioner training um, and it was a big a very big group um, there was only one other business person. Other people were um, therapists or just individuals, not in the corporate world. So there was one other corporate person on the program, which was a great advantage in a way for me because I was really kind of, the timing was fantastic from a point of view of eventually launching NLP into the workplace because I started to make connections between... <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm late. I just um, I just saw the email. That <laughs> that's fine. Is that Shavor? Oh, it's Leslie. Hello, Leslie. Leslie. Yeah. Hello. Would it be possible wow. to mute yourself, Leslie, by going to the left-hand corner and muting, pressing the mute? Think, yeah. Muting on this one. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, so where was I then? <laughs> I got distracted by noise. Um, oh, I was just one of two business people on that program. And 
at that time, personal development was seen to be very different to business development, but it started to ring all sorts of bells for me, the significance of it. It started with me using it for myself, and I still do, and that's a very important aspect of NLP. It's about apply to self before anything else. Um, I think that once you apply to self, you're then in a position to coach other people, to support other people, but you need to get the messages for yourself first of all. Um, so eventually, um, and it was some time after I attended that first program, um, I was approached by a publisher to write NLP at work, uh, which was incredible. You know, I didn't have to troll around looking for a publisher. Um, but my goal then was to make it accessible, um, to make it a very approachable as a topic, because I found a lot of the literature that was around, I found it quite heavy, very technical, full of jargon. I mean, very clever and very uh, inspiring. But I thought, well, there's a lot of people who are not going to go beyond the first pages if that's what they see. And so taking the, some of the technology out of it and making it very accessible and kind of conversational was my goal in writing that book. And the NLP at work is deliberately ambiguous as a title because um, some people come and say, well, um, you know, is it just for people in business? Well, it's for everybody. Um, and it's personal and business, um, personal or business. It's, I think that's the beauty of it is that people can apply NLP to whatever area they choose. It's very generic. Um, and so rather than being just about appraisals or just about communication or just about negotiating or about relationships, it's about all of those things. Um, so I think that that gives it a very, very broad appeal and it you know makes it very attractive to many people when they realize it's tailored to them. And that's very important about my programs as well, is that um, you know, the not knowing state extends to there not being a fixed agenda. Um, I was referring to the description of NLP earlier as being not knowing and being real time and open to feedback. Um, and so it's having this ability to be in the moment. I mean, you don't have to be, um, but it is very much about that, how to be able to respond, how to speak in the moment and react to the feedback that you're getting at the time. Um, so for that reason, I mean, I have outcomes for programs, but I work with what emerges for people in the group. So we use what's happening in the group and people's examples of what um, they're saying, what they're doing actually working with that so it's it's happening there and then and and i think there's a very important message in that about programs is that that's life uh, we don't know what's going to happen in life um, and probably one of the biggest things that we can gain from it i mean there's many things is that it helps us deal with whatever does happen like life's curved balls um, it, it puts us in a position or we can use it to put ourselves in a position where we are resourceful. Now, I don't know anybody who's resourceful all the time, um, but I do find that people who learn these approaches are much more able to manage themselves in a way that they choose, so they can deal with whatever happens and they can influence what's important to them in life and in work. I like what you, you use the word approaches and a lot of people use the term techniques um, in NLP, yes. and, and I love that difference. That for me, that for me, that's a big difference. Yes. Well, I'm just I'm writing, and hopefully nearing the end of writing another book at the moment, which is about coaching. Um, and one of the things I bang on about in trainings is that um, it's not just about techniques. In fact, the techniques are the output of NLP. It's the process of studying what makes the difference. It's, so if I do something well, or you do something well, um, it's saying, well, what precisely did you do then that caused that success? So that you can repeat it, so you can reproduce it. If something doesn't go so well, it's being able to unpack that and go, well, what happened there? So that you can, if you like, put in new steps for yourself for the future. Um, and 
the techniques are what we discover along the way. They are incredible techniques. There's, and I've got many techniques in the book, you know, NLP at work. But I do emphasize that they are the output. So in the coaching book that I'm writing at the moment, um, the sections currently, this can always change when it finally gets to the publisher, but are, it's principles of change. It's the principles in the strategies and the skills that we can use. And then it's finally some techniques and the principles that are important in employing them. But what I find is that when people grasp the principles, um, that actually you can almost predict what each of the techniques is going to be able to do rather than having to learn them all by rote. Um, and the risk is if you learn techniques by rote is that you get very attached to the techniques rather than to the client or to the person that you're with. So they're very useful, um, but it's very important to be able to use them flexibly. And I think what matters is really what are the underlying tenets and change um, that uh, inform all those processes. So yes, I, um, but they're there and they're very useful. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why I, I call some of my programs intensive. And it doesn't mean to say people work from dawn till dusk. In fact, quite the opposite, really. They're intensive in the sense that um, I presuppose that people have these skills already because they do. Um, so I'm not teaching in order for them to learn all these things anew. We're looking at how they've got the approaches and how they can develop them. Um, so operating from the basis of that presupposition accelerates the whole process. Um, it's like, you know, one of my sons is in the forces and before he became an officer, he was made an officer and then the training was to actually equip him, you know, with the thinking and the attitude. But it wasn't that he had to do it in order to become an officer, it was the other way around. And the same is true for me. I, start with the end in mind as um, Stephen Covey would say um, say people are leaders they are coaches um, they are trainers they are managers you know they are significant and everybody has excellence and it's like how do we how do we live into those places I'm going to open open this up to our listeners Sue and see if any anybody wants okay. to any questions regarding that is that okay Yes, absolutely. Does anybody have any questions for Sue? Has she shared that information so far? So will they type a question or? You can either type a question or you can unmute yourself as, as we're a small group. Okay. Yeah, so I have a question. Okay. Um, so I, I was just thinking, I'm imagining always that there is like a lake and that lake is uh, where you call like spontaneousness or uh, being simple, naive, getting into intuition, whatever the word is that explains that lake. And then when we grow up or we start having that bottle of education, culture, bringing up, and we take a few drops of that lake and walk away. So is yes. there a way or approaches or techniques or whatever it is um, that help us to get in connection with the lake more instead of yes. just having this bottle? And is that covered in your book or in the training? The answer is yes. <laughs> oh, <okay>. and, <laughs> um, I mean, it's beautiful metaphor. Uh, one of the, I, I talked early on in the conversation about people who'd inspired me on the journey. And one of those people was a man called David Grove, who was the source of clean questions. Um, and he worked particularly with metaphor. So, you know, it, it, you, what you just said absolutely fits beautifully into that. Metaphors are so powerful. They're so rich. Um, yes, there's a lot of things because in a way, there's quite a bit of unlearning for people to do. They get, especially people who are in the corporate world, get very used to being task focused, um, problem centered, to work hard. Um, to have to get things right before they do anything. Now, I wouldn't expect them to lose that because there's a time and a place for everything. Um, but it's very experiential, the whole program. And so things like what David Grove developed were clean questions, how to ask 
in a way that keeps yourself to a minimum, how to be naive in the way. So that's a technique that very much supports that. And there are beliefs, um, what I call beliefs of excellence. Um, and they all make sense to people until they actually come to put them into practice. You know, so for example, there's one belief, which is that there's no failure, only feedback. And people can say, yes, you know, I can understand that. But when we do an exercise, I find that the majority of people will try and get it right before they actually participate. Um, and that's, that's a big learning for them to realize how willing or not are they to just have a go at doing things as a child would, for example, um, and then learn from the feedback. So, so yes, 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 and yes. There's lots and lots of things that we do because that's so key to, you know, modeling is the ultimate if you like, it's the essence of NLP, to be able to study excellence in ourselves um, and to be able to study the excellence and discover that in myself, in yourself. For me to understand and discover the excellence in you, I'd, I'd need to be absolutely naive. If I make assumptions, I'm going to contaminate what I discover. Um, and we always do to some extent. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to be completely clean, that whole quality that you describe is is absolutely at the heart of what it's all about. Yes. So it's a, in a way it's, it's it's like people have we have this we have this ability. Children learn by modelling. You know they they watch they listen they reproduce, and as you say, unfortunately a lot of that gets trained out of people with the some of the traditional educational systems. Um, and it's about returning to that and realizing we have this very natural ability to learn. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's a delight to be able to reintroduce people to that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your question. It was a beautiful question. Anyone else would like to ask or share something that comes up after, shoot, after Sue's wonderful explanation? May I just share something and ask something? Please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm currently um, working with people who have been what we might think of as inspectors in schools. And um, my job is to um, try to help them to change their mindset to become coaches to teachers instead of um, evaluators and inspectors. Right, well. Wow. And I'm just thinking, and, and this is why I wanted to join this session, was because I'm thinking that um, I probably need to study NLP more myself in order to be able to um, help them on their journey because they're finding it very difficult. Um, they have, it's like they have a hat which is very firmly rammed onto their heads which says I'm, a, I'm an evaluator. Um, and I, I need to shift them from that position to saying I am a coach and I'm, I'm supporting the teachers, not, not judging them. Yes. And do you think that um, I could, I would find support, if, you know, in studying NLP, would I find support for that journey, do you think? You can probably predict what my answer is going to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's so true in many areas that unfortunately the role that um people in many roles take is to like to be judgmental or evaluate when there is an opportunity um to encourage and to enable people to develop and grow and learn i mean for me coaching is um, a paradigm shift that's needed in the world you know i think about people who've been coaches to me one of the other people who was a great inspiration to me was my all-time first and all-time NLP trainer is a man called Gene Early um, and so he was the main trainer on the first that very first program I attended and since then um, we're friends he's my coach um, and I just find that to have that kind of support um, it's just immense and there's so many people I think in the world who don't have that um, so I think that this whole shift to coaching, supporting, 
listening, understanding, seeing the excellence in people, enabling to enabling them and ourselves to bring that excellence out. I just think if that were to, you know, the more we can reach a tipping point in the world where um, that's the case, I really believe that's the antidote to wars and conflict. I mean, it's a huge dream, but I, I really do believe that, you know, it's something like this. It's a very different way of thinking than some of the very sort of tactical approaches that many people take. Um, so yes, and, and it starts with yourself. I think you, yeah. I don't know, you know, how to tell somebody how to use it in their realm, but I do know how to help people get it for themselves and then support them in how they take, for example, I work with um, an organization that helps homeless in the UK um, and not just helps them find um, a home, but helps them get back into life um, now, that's not my area of expertise, but I work with the people in that organization. And their goal has been to become coaches, you know, rather than kind of organizers and, and helpers who also do a great job, but they realize they can make the biggest difference by learning how to coach these people. So I work with them and they then work with the people that they're expert with. So, yes, and it starts, absolutely starts with you. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I think uh, it was a, a metaphor I used, or somebody used for me years and years ago. Um, they said on the very big boats, there's um, well, any boat, there's a rudder that that directs, you know, that um, determines the direction of the boat. And on the very big boats, um, there's a rudder on the rudder. It's called a trim tab. Um, so it has something that steers the rudder, that steers the boat. And somebody said to me once, um, you're like a trim tab. And I thought, I like that. Um, and that's also a principle of NLP. It's like, how do we find the, the most effective intervention to make the biggest difference? Um, how do we be the most efficient we can be? So it's like the minimum input for maximum result. Um, and I... I love working in that way. It's, it's one of the reasons why I work with the people that I do, for example, in India. Um, I believe we have a, a setup there, if you like, or a community of people there where minimum input and they then translate what I teach them to reach well, thousands of people. Um, and I think that's the key. That's the key to success. That's the key to change. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Wael has a, has a comment. Um, as I he, he says, as I hear this, I recall reading a book, A More Beautiful Question, in which a reference mm. is made to the beginner's mind and keeping one's cup empty. Sue yes. made a reference to children. Is age a factor to acquire NLP techniques? Is age a factor, yeah. would you say? Yeah. Um, well... <laughs> Children have it, they have NLP techniques, maybe not consciously, but they, they just model automatically. Otherwise, no, I've had some very young people. Um, I mean, I had somebody who came to a program in India and they brought their children to the resort as well. And the idea was that children would be occupied, they would have people to sort of, and from time to time they came in they just come in a little bit early they came into the program and they made the most amazing contributions and they gave the most incredible feedback they didn't stay with us all the time but it was amazing just so i've had um teenagers i'm just saying who's the oldest person it's probably me i'm probably the oldest person on all the programs um so i don't it's the same with any when i do conferences um so I do a lot of talks and conferences as well. And very often one of the questions for speakers is that, um, who is this suitable for? You know, is it for a particular group? Should they have had a certain experience? Should they be a certain age? My answer is always, it's open to everybody. If somebody wants to do it, if somebody wants to learn, there's no, there's no boundaries on that. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, no age limits whatsoever. In fact, we should bring some of the young, more of the young ones in. To, but I bring in, that's the other thing. Um, 
it depends what level people take the NLP training to. You can, every stage is complete in itself. So for example, in Doha, I'm going to be doing a practitioner training, which has got all the elements, um, you know, that are the foundation, but it's a complete program in itself. And it's very often life changing for some people. Some people don't want to have their lives changed. They just want to enrich them. And it certainly does that. Some people go on from that, you know, for example, uh, Jackie, who's online, um, she's gone on and done further training. And the next stage is a, a master practitioner where people specialize in modeling something specific so they can choose an area um, that they really want to concentrate. Now, we do some of that modeling in the practitioner as well. Um, so people start to think about what specifically would they like to concentrate on and what would they like to focus on. And they're learning all the skills that would enable them to do that. So um, I'm not sure I start, where did I start with that question? I was going somewhere. <laughs> what, was the, what was the question before that? Um, I think the question was, is it, is it uh, just for children? Oh. Or? Yeah, no, for any, absolutely yeah. anybody. Is a, the question was, Sue, is age a factor to acquire NLP techniques? No, not at all. Well, I think it's more people's attitude. Um, the thing I find, uh, one of the attitudes that makes the biggest difference is that people approach it, people who want to learn. Um, I think that's true in any area at all. One of the reasons why I love working in India is because Indians have a great respect for teachers. They, they want to have a teacher in their lives. Um, and they can be quite shocked sometimes at the way maybe some UK delegates might question or be cynical. And I don't mind that. I mean, I, I'm very happy, but, but I do find that um, because of this respect and this desire, this passion to learn that I've encountered in many of the Indian delegates, they get the most out of it because they can choose what they do with it subsequently anyway. So you might as well take it all on, um, try it out, find out what works for you. And then you can make your decisions about how you use that. So um, no, that's, that's the biggest factor is, is, is people wanting to learn whatever age they are. Wonderful. And, and Ola has a, a comment and a question, Sue. She says, I really liked it when Sue mentioned thought process leading to techniques. Is it, fle yes. is it flexible that after focusing yes. on learning certain thought process and practice, we can come up with our own techniques? Oh, absolutely. That's the whole idea. That's the whole purpose of modeling is that you study yourself you study people that you admire um, and that you then develop the whole that's the whole thing about NLP is it, it's a constantly developing growing um, body of ideas thoughts knowledge that's a measure of success um, so for me it, the work that students do in their own areas of study and they discover new techniques that's what the success in NLP is if somebody is still for example, teaching the same things that they taught five years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, I would say they're not doing NLP. Um, I mean, for example, I mentioned clean questions. Well, they didn't exist as such in that form um, when NLP was founded. So it's a, that those kind of came into the whole realm. Um, oh, gosh, I'm just trying to think how many years ago, but certainly within the last 10 years, I would say. Um, and that's how it should be. Um, and so we're discovering things that, that help to enhance the process as well. So yes, that's what I expect is for people to discover their own models, definitely. And this, there are lots of those examples. I've got some on my own website of things that people, you know, delegates have generated. And pe some people have gone on and because they've studied things so specifically, so uniquely, they've become their speciality. And um, some people have turned those studies into books, for example. Um, and that becomes their kind of area of work because they have learned so much about it. 
it's from my perspective learning about this studying of excellence it's it just gives you a totally new deep perspective on uh discovering yourself and others sue oh absolutely um it's this there's beauty in everybody um some people might and talent in everybody some people might uh, perhaps address their talent to sometimes not very productive or not very healthy areas but there's still a talent there that's the point it's the structure behind the behavior so even if someone let's say even if somebody's well one example i used a while ago was when we had a lot of riots in the uk and the crowds gathered you know incredibly quickly to um, and organize themselves well somebody was doing that somebody was organizing them and being able to call a lot of people to action now it wasn't particularly pleasant the results of that but you go well there's some people who are leading in a quite a remarkable way they happen to be applying it to this particular area of getting people together for very destructive means very destructive ends in some cases but that's the key to change for many people is to recognize that somewhere within themselves, they have got a structure that they can transfer to other contexts. Um, that it's, it's their own. And I also find coaching with that principle in mind is very empowering for people. It's not about telling them what to do. It's about showing them and highlighting where they already have the qualities and skills that they're looking for. So yes, everyone, everyone has excellence. And I, I just think that's amazing. You know, it's, everybody's got a story. Um, and I just find the people that I meet in life amazing. Um, it's incredible what you can discover about people. Just, just a few. I love that the book um, that was just mentioned, you know, The Beautiful Question. Um, and it is about the quality of the questions. It's much more than it is about the answers. <laughs> yes. And as um, YL shared with us, the author of that book, uh, A More Beautiful Question, is Warren Berger, if anybody's interested in, in looking. Oh, fantastic. And we have... I, I'm, in, I'm interested in looking at it as well. Yeah. I haven't heard that book. <laughs> um, Sue so, so Karen has, uh, has said, an enriching webinar so far. Thank you. Do you think that experience in coaching will help when adopting the approach to NLP? Or can you learn both approaches alongside one another? <laughs> um, it's an interesting question because Karen's asking for a generalization as an answer. <laughs> and it, it, it must, I'd say the answer's in the experience. I don't know. Um, I believe, yes. I believe that you can learn anything. Um, it depends on the person. It depends on the situation. Um, you know, for example, there might be some people who are so attached to, let's say, a step-by-step -step coaching process that they might be reluctant to let go of that or to look at something in addition. So it's to do with the person. Um, however, there would be somebody else who's learned a step-by-step -step process. And that gives. It's like learning to drive a car. You know, I remember learning step-by-step. -step, you've got to do this, do that, do the other. And then you can relax into, you know, being in the moment and not even thinking about, you know, I drove all the way through France yesterday. In fact, I did have a bit of an issue just when I got to the last part of the journey and I realized I was on the wrong side of the road, fortunately on a very quiet road in La Havre. But I thought I was doing it so automatically, I started to switch into the UK way of thinking for driving we just do that automatically um, and that's the idea is to be able to have all the structure but to have practiced it enough for it to be embedded and become unconscious so that we can concentrate in the moment <laughs> fortunately i was facing a very patient driver in the other car i thought why are they stunned why is that car so still i thought oh my goodness me i'm not in the uk yet <laughs> At least it didn't, Fortunately, it ended up well. <laughs> yes, it did. Fortunately, it was on a, a back road that was very slow moving traffic and not on a, not a, I think if it's a busy road, you sort of, you've got other people to indicate, you know, which way, but oh dear, that was a moment. So, so, so I, I know I've been asked uh, by 
people in business about this uh, program that you're bringing to Qatar. And a lot of them, potentially managers, are saying, you know, I want to use this to change my staff. What, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, well, I remember somebody I saw years ago um, who always stood out in my memory, um, who was, I used to work for International Computers Limited, they were eventually taken over by Fujitsu, um, and in the ICL days, um, there was the northern part of the business, which was the manufacturing part, and the southern part of the business was mainly the marketing and the sales, and and they had wanted to transform one of the manufacturing sites up north. There's usually a north and a south equivalent in most countries, isn't it? And they had appointed this man who was from the south, from the marketing, who had a very sudden marketing attitude to go and change this kind of revamp the manufacturing site. And he was struggling. And um, and he asked me to go up and it was, he, either he or his manager asked me to go up and support him and help him and, I, and on Fridays they had um, a casual dress day but he never casually dressed he always wore the suit that he would wear in the south and I remember him sitting across the desk from me saying now I need to change these people up here um, you know these northern people they're really difficult he said um, so I need your help in doing that um, and he said and while you're at it could you help me change my boss as well because you know he's really critical and he's tricky and difficult and and I looked at him across the desk and said and how about you and he said I'm okay <laughs> I don't think he, he didn't stay in that job very long actually so I mean I'm very much you know with um, Gandhi's approach to life that we he did say we must but um to bring about change we must be the example that we want in the world it's our example most of the influence to other people takes place i think not through our words necessarily but through our example um it's often in the most challenging moments i don't I don't wish for, you know, really challenging moments on courses. Well, I suppose in a way I do, because when things go kind of, when there is a curved ball, it's an opportunity to um, almost like be an example of something that's important. Um, and I think people get more from those moments than they would do from, say, not that I would ever typically lecture anybody, but from a, you know, a prescribed sort of set of, um, information so um, most people are influenced unconsciously um, and it's so for when I'm running a course and I'm not I've not got an agenda for example I mean I do know what threads I'm, I do know what I'm doing and I do know what threads I'm going to be covering I don't know when I'm going to cover them um, but my intention is that the bigger message is that uh, we can go through life not needing to know everything all the time we can be open to ambiguity that's how we handle the unknown scenarios um, and so it's the design behind the program that has in a way has the biggest influence it's the way i design it and i say this to like jackie for example who's online who's training as a trainer that um, trainers in nlp i don't think should be presenters they are designers of experiences in which people can learn um, and there's always going to be an experience where something emerges about somebody that you've not seen before in any way and it's amazing what that can be you know I just completed a program in France and um, on the Friday I usually take people to the market there and I have a friend who does the cooking for me for the lunches and and she does an evening dinner on the last night as well and she was finding that quite a lot of work so we decided that we would give the course members a budget so they would buy things from the market for the lunch on that day well that brought out some talents in people and so I have aptitudes in people I'd never seen in the rest of the program because you just don't know um what's going to emerge so it's almost the, the greater the variety of experiences um the more likely somebody's and so somebody emerged as absolutely the kind of the person who could pull all that together and we had the most most amazing moving lunch that i think i've had for years actually as a consequence of that because they chose to 
think about the Syrian refugees. And instead of buying loads of food, they actually bought very simple food. Um, and they gave me the money back that I gave to them uh, to donate to the uh, Syrian refugees cause. And I thought, goodness me. And so we just, they talked about that. They shared that. And we had this very simple bread and fruit. And I thought, wow, what an amazing experience. I wouldn't have come up with that. I hadn't come up with that myself. Wow. Um, oh, I know something else, there was something else I was going to say earlier on. Um, actually, before, that is, you, I, before, Sue, before yes. you say that, uh, Wael wants to just share something with you. And he says, as a Syrian American, I find that very touching. Oh, it was amazing. I just, you know, we were so removed. And in fact, um, I went to a meal with some friends here um, in France. And we we're talking about how do we open our homes? How do we open our homes to Syrian people who are just trying to find a place in the world. Uh, and it was amazing. They, uh, one of my friends had gone to the local mayor who knew nothing about it, had no plans whatsoever. So some of the people who have the possibility to make a difference, you know, were not even engaged with the idea. But just to hear them, people saying, right, you know, well, let's, you can actually register to offer your home to people. I thought, Yes, it's, it, it has to be, it has to be me. Only I can do something about what, what makes a difference. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think we're, we're very blessed in the type of work we do and the, the, the type of environment that we are, that we do attract to your program, to our programs here in, in Empower World, the type of people who do want to make a difference from their heart, yes. from yes. their experience. And, you know, Absolutely. As, as Mother Teresa said, you know, if you want to make a difference, it begins in your own heart. Absolutely. And it's just, it's an honour to be able to support people in any way that will just enable them to do that um, a bit more, a bit more extensively, whatever they need. Absolutely. So, so with 10 minutes towards the end, if somebody wants, if somebody's thinking about coming on your, to your program in Doha with um, a notebook and pen and is going to be <laughs> PowerPoints. What would you say to that? <laughs> Don't come. <laughs> so share, somebody what, else. <laughs> yeah, uh, share what we can experience with you. I wouldn't say don't come, really. I mean, it's partly tongue in cheek. And you probably know that, you know, one of the other people I studied was Frank Farrelly, who taught or was an example of provocative therapy. So humor is a, and that's what I really gained from him is how to, how to learn through humor, um, how to be provocative in response to some situations. Um, so some people, a lot of people do start off with notebooks and pens, but they realize that it's the kind of learning that gets into, it's, it's a whole body learning. Um, and if I want to pay attention to somebody else and notice what's happening, if I'm looking at a notebook, I'm not going to, I'm going to miss some really key things. I've seen people do that, really miss things. And it's my responsibility for anybody who comes on the training to get that learning um, without, I mean, by all means, if they really want to take notes, but I'd probably find some way where it would be impossible. There's some kind of exercise where it just wouldn't be possible to do it. Um, there certainly aren't going to be PowerPoint slides, that's for sure, because that the bigger message again is that we have all the resources we need within ourselves, um, and it's learning how to use ourselves fully um, in order to make a difference. Happy. So, so if they want to come along to find another way, certainly. <laughs> if they want to come along and maybe have me probably sort of be a little bit provocative with some of that, by all means, come along. Um, but I usually find people have left notebooks by about, at least by about day two. Hmm. Oh, I did have somebody recently who hung on to it for the whole week, but I think eventually it was just, they were just carrying it with them. They weren't writing very much. <laughs> Mind you, it did backfire for me because um, I, the lady I mentioned before who does the cooking for me on the programs, she is an amazing cook and she does run cookery courses. Uh, or most of the delegates in France stay with this lady and then she 
she brings lunches over as well. And I decided to revive my cooking skills. And they know my delegates very well. You know, they've had a lot of people stay with them. And anyway, I said, well, can I come and just hang around you? In my terms, it was going to be model her, how she does the cooking. Um, so I went and um, to be her assistant for a week um, to prepare the evening meals, not while the course was on, but at another time. And I took my notebook and her husband said to me, who knows all my delegates said, no notebook, so. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's really come back. <laughs> You're back influencing. <laughs> <laughs> he well, said, you, your, your delegates are always coming back in the evening and saying, Sue says no notebooks. He said, so you can't have a notebook either. <laughs> Fabulous. I thought, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> Sue, while has another comment he'd like to share, it seems that according to the NLP way of thinking, positive influence happens through example and not necessarily through explicitly advising others using words. Is there oh, I think it, sorry. Let, I'll just finish that, Sue. Is there anyone close enough to you, like a close sibling, best friend, your spouse, that you can't rely on, that you can't rely only on influence through example, where things yes. need to be verbalized sometimes? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It's not, it's, there's no absolutes, um, absolute right. I just think that example is very important. You know, if I'm using words, um, but I'm not being an example of those words, and I think there's going to be a mixed message. Um, but for example, you know, I mentioned Gene early, who's my coach. And there's been times when he's just told me something very directly. I mean, one time, I was actually, I had a team of, a big team of associates and um, I felt very incongruent with how the biz, my business was developing. I found I was spending more time managing than I was doing what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, I'll speak to Gene, um, you know, and he can coach me on this. And I was trying to sell the business at the time and that was becoming very tortuous. And he just said to me, and so uh, he was his words, he said, give it away. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> but I thought, you know, I trust him completely. Um, if that's what he believes, you know, and that's what he's telling me to do, I'll do it. Wow. I tried to give it away for a year. Nobody would have it. <laughs> or, no, not so much that they wouldn't have it, but just people couldn't get themselves organized to, to take it. But, but I certainly went down that route. And in the end, I just concentrated on the on the bits that I did and let the other part go. I, I like so, yes. Yeah. What I'm hearing there is that courageous um, ability to speak up when, when, when things need to be said. Yes, well, Frank Farrelly, who did the provocative, he would, he would speak about what we would say is the elephant in the room. You know, he would speak the things that other people thought or that person was thinking for themselves. So he did use words very skillfully used words, um, but spoke a truth and had a way of doing it that was loving. You know, it was provocative in the sense that it provoked, he would say, provoked a healing response. He did it lovingly and with the intention of raising awareness. Um, but yes, absolutely, there's times when speaking something is, is the answer. Yeah. And I, I always say that coaching, and I, I'm including NLP in that whole part of coaching, is a conversation like no other. And, and as an NLP practitioner, practitioner and coach, it's about sometimes saying what nobody else will say. Absolutely, yes. So I see Leslie's raised her hand, Sue. Can we, okay. can we can, Leslie, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, yeah, thank you. I realize it's getting a bit late now, but um, I'm very interested in um, parenting. Um, not myself, my children are grown and my grandchildren are grown, but um, from the point of view of supporting parents to understand how to bring their children up, um, how to help them cope with life, basically. Um, I mean, I've spent 20 years in the Middle East and I know that many of the parents here, um, the local parents, they don't really have a, a great understanding of, of what their children need in order to become sort of fully functioning adults in this modern world. Um, 
and, and I'm just wondering if you've done work with families or if you think that working with families as a as a focus would be you know the NLP would be helpful in that respect. Oh definitely I mean I've got people and one of the things that I think I value in what I do is that I have this great community of people who are doing work in all sorts of areas and there's um, a few people who are really specializing in that parenting NLP for children NLP for parents I mean I'm a grandmother I think we should have NLP for grandmothers because that's even more challenging I think than being a parent because you, you've got to keep quiet sometimes <laughs> how to influence it indirectly um, so yes um, again it and, and the organization that took me to um, India in the first place is an organization called Brain O Brain that works with parents and teachers and ultimately children um, and so that was that was the starting work that I did they took it to the parents and to the teachers and then to the children but I worked with the the teams of people who did that but I have some um, yes close friends who've written books, who do a lot of work with that whole area. Yes, absolutely. And at what better time to start, really? I mean, some people just absolutely do it beautifully. And that's the other thing about NLP is that um, it, the answers don't have to come from, like, me, the trainer. I look at people who are models of excellence, and I often bring in, regularly bring in people who are models of excellence of different things. They don't think they are sometimes. Um, and we just look at how they do what they do. In fact, the people who don't think they are, are the best examples. They're usually the best models of excellence. The people who think they are, sometimes, well, they have excellence, but you know, it's nice to just, it's nice to get it with people who are modest, you know, who are very humble about their capabilities, who take it for granted, and to be able to celebrate that. So, you know, I look at great examples of parents or great examples of teachers or whatever, and we study them. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're very welcome. So we are coming up to our last minute. Um, Sue, would, would you like to share anything to close off this webinar this evening? Um, just to say how lovely the questions have been. Um, some beautiful metaphors in the questions um, and yes I think you've taken me into paths through the questions that you've asked uh, which I very much enjoyed so I would thank you for those very much yes I would I would concur it's been a, a lovely experience this this hour and uh, for, for anybody who is interested in joining the program with Sue, just a reminder that the dates are the 23rd to the 29th of October. And if you are interested in joining, please feel free to get in touch with us through our website or at support, uh, support at empower-world.com. Sue, as always, it's a pleasure chatting to you, learning from you. Really excited about you coming over. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you for all the organisation that you're doing because um, that's a delight just to be able to step into something like this. Um, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, everybody, for your full partic participation this evening. It's a, been a pleasure to see the people I know and meet the people I, I, I don't know. So look forward to connecting. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.